participate in this sermon. You amen, I preach faster, I promise. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. And he says here, we will praise you forever. Then watch this. From generation to generation, we will proclaim your praise. In other words, the psalmist says, it's not going to stop with me. I'm going to pass it on to my kids who will pass it on to their kids who will pass it on to their kids. God is calling us to be generationally one. And God wants us to absolutely be determined that we're going to allow Him to use us in a great way. I was reading in Hebrews chapter 11 this week. How many people read Hebrews 11? Come on, how many of you have read that? It's a powerful chapter. Uh, it's called the Hall of Fame of Faith by most of us who, who have read it and know it, familiar with it. It's, it's this litany, this listing of uh, men and women of God who, who took a stand for God. It's great. Uh, one of the things that I noticed as I was reading Hebrews chapter 11, uh, and you may or may not have noticed this, uh, but it is in sequential generational order. Have you noticed this? I mean, it's the sequential listing. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews goes way back. He reaches way back and he begins to list sequentially and generationally. It's incredible what's there. He mentions Abel. He mentions Enoch. He mentions Abraham and Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. And then he lists his bunches and bunches of them together that are from the period of what we would call the judges in the Old Testament. And then the next period he mentions is David and Samuel. And we know that Samuel was the last judge. And we know that beginning with David and moving on moves into what we understand in the Old Testament as the period of the kings. It is set out in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 uh, sequentially one after another generation to generation to generation and then it flows into this passage in Hebrews chapter 12 that says wherefore seeing that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every sin and every weight and the sin that so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. The writer of Hebrews borrows an Olympic terminology uh, when he says the great cloud of witnesses. In, in ancient Greek there was a phrase that you used if you went to the Colosseum or if you went to a Greek sporting event and you ended up sitting way up in the big top seats. How many of you know we call that the nosebleed section today? Yeah, that's what we call it. But in, in Greek, ancient Greek culture, they didn't call it that. What they called it was setting in the clouds. They would say, you have a seat in the clouds. And so the writer of Hebrews literally is borrowing this metaphor. And what he's painting a picture of are these stands filled with people, the ones generation to generation to generation that go all the way back through the Bible that are seated there as we run this race looking to Jesus that are cheering us on. Seated in those seats this morning is my mom. She's seated in those seats this morning. My little mama, if a good strong wind came along, it would blow her away. That's one gene I did not get. It takes hurricane force winds to move me. How many of you understand this? My mom was just a tiny little lady, and, and, and this morning I can see her in heaven with her little hands upraised, and she's, she's cheering her son on going, preach it, boy. Come on, preach it. About two rows back from her is her mom and dad, my mama and my papa, and my papa's on his feet clapping his hands, saying, come on, son, make me proud. Tell them the truth. Cheer them on. I'm telling you, we've got a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us that are cheering us on and God is calling you to cheer on the next generation. Whatever I am today is largely because of the people who invested in my life years ago. Not only my grandfather, who was a man of God, my, my mom and dad, even when they didn't go to church, would send us to church. How many of you had a mom and dad like that that you were required to go to church? Two things that we, we didn't have to eat but three things we had to do. We had to do chores, we had to go to school, and we had to go to church. Those were the three things. If you didn't do chores, and you didn't go to school, and you didn't go to church, then there would be a funeral with your name on it. Amen. You would die. And so going to church on Sunday was a requirement in my house. And 
And even though there was, some, there was a little hypocrisy in there at times, when mom and dad didn't go themselves, I am so thankful to God that they made me go and threatened me within an inch of my life so I'd be in the house of God. Because it was in that house of God, it was in that place, that little bitty tiny church, sample assembly of God. It's this tiny little place in the middle of nowhere. I don't think they've ever had more than like 30 members in the history of the entire church. Last time I checked, they were down to eight people, but that little church is still going strong. And there were faithful men and women in that church who loved God and who loved little guys like me. I, I can call them by name because they left a mark on me. Uh, they passed something on to me. I remember a guy by the name of Joe Nunley. Joe was the worship leader in our church. Uh, uh, Joe had a southern drawl to him. And when he sang, he, 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 if it didn't have the word y'all in it, he would insert the word y'all in it in the hymns. He had a gift for making it southernized. And he, would, he sang songs of the worship in our church. He also taught Sunday school. He led the Royal Ranger program. He was the VBS director. He had a lot to do with shaping me and molding me and speaking into my life. And then there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Frances Cox. And Frances wasn't very fancy in her teaching style. She'd never been trained to be a teacher. But she loved Jesus and she had a relationship with Him. And, and, and she had a hard life and she had learned to have faith in God. And every Sunday she would teach us faithfully. And what I remember about that Sunday school class is I would sit there as Francis taught us the Bible. And somewhere along about halfway through the class, it happened almost every Sunday, the power of God would come down on Francis Cox in that room. And she would be overcome by the Spirit of the Lord. And she would begin to weep and cry and tell us how much she loved her Jesus. And sometimes she'd get so full of the Holy Spirit that she'd start start speaking in tongues and I wasn't real sure what that meant except I knew better than to pull some funny stunt at that moment because God might kill me. How many understands? God was in that room all over that woman and I would sit there and all as she would close those Sunday school services almost like a preacher would a service and she'd lay hands on us and pray for us and she would encourage us and strengthen us and then there was one of my pastors, I had several, but one of my pastors by the name of Ernie Crowley. And Ernie Crowley loved God with all of his heart. And Ernie was a, a preacher, simple preacher, but he was a great man of God who, who just every week faithfully preached the Word of God. I would sit beside of my mom and my demon-possessed brother and my demon-possessed cousin, and we would sit in church every week. And we would sit there and we would listen, but it, it wasn't really hitting home. And then one Sunday morning, Ernie got through with his message. And he said every head bowed and every eye closed. And something happened that Sunday morning. Because the Holy Spirit began to walk the aisles of that little church. There was only three aisles in that little church. And at some point, the Holy Spirit walked down that center aisle, took a left down the row I was sitting in. And all of a sudden, I started crying. My brother started crying. My cousin started crying. The next thing I know, we're in the altar. We're asking Jesus into our life as Ernie Crowley, our pastor, was hugging on us and loving on us and leading us in the sinner's prayer, raising his hand and saying, thank you, Jesus, as tears poured down his face. I'll never forget that day because it was the day I met Jesus Christ and he Turned my world upside down. That afternoon I went home and my mama cooked the best chicken dinner. How many of you know food tastes better after you give your life to Jesus? It does. I ate the best fried chicken I've ever eaten in my life that day. And for the first time that I could ever remember, me and my brother, my demon-possessed brother, who now had been delivered by the power of God, we volunteered. How many of you have a dishwasher at home? Let me see your hands. Point at him if he's here. Is he? You know, <laughs> most of you have electric dishwashers. Before the era of electric dishwashers, my mama had dishwashers. It was me and my brother. We didn't work really well. We hated doing dishes. We'd do anything to get out of dishes. We'd hide in the closet to get out of dishes. But that Sunday morning, after we ate that anointed, we had that anointed service. That afternoon, we ate that anointed chicken. I volunteered to wash the dishes. My brother volunteered to dry. I mean, for us to be within two feet of each other and not be World War III was a miracle and testimony to the saving power of Jesus Christ to begin with. 
And we're standing there and I'm, I'm whistling songs. I'm, I'm singing hymns and I'm, I'm, I'm elbow deep in soap and grease. And, and we're washing dishes and praising the Lord. And the telephone rings and my mama answered the phone. And for the first time, the phone call was me. I had 12 years old. I, I didn't get phone calls. And I took the phone call to my pastor on the other end of the line. I'll never forget. As Ernie said to me, Mike, I am so proud of you. You made me so proud today as your pastor. He said, you made the greatest decision you'll ever make for the rest of your life. Don't you ever forget that which I have not forgotten. And he said, Mike, let this decision affect every decision you ever make from now on. And God is with you. I'm so proud of you. Listen, that day, Ernie Crowley reached back to my generation and he pulled me up to where I needed to be. How many of you know that's what we need to do? These were heroes in my life. They molded me. They shaped me. They poured into me. And if you'll think hard enough, you'll think of one or two of those heroes in your life who did the same thing for you. Now very quickly, I want to take you to a couple of places in the Old Testament to show you where the ball was dropped, where the baton was not handed off. Go with, with me quickly to Judges chapter 2. Would you go there very quickly? Judges chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 7 and 8, and then we're going to read a little bit more down through this passage. It's an eye-opening passage. Now, if you're familiar with the movie Courageous, and you know at one point in the movie, these guys sign a resolution. They, they, they become resolute about being the husbands and fathers God's called them to be. And they sign a document, and, and we're going to do that here in this church, men. So just, just we're working out the, the details and how exactly how we're going to do that. So uh, be, be listening because we're going to contact you and let you know how and when we're going to do that. But at the bottom of the resolution is a quote from Joshua that says, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is a great study in leadership. Joshua was a great man of God. But, listen to me, at some point there was a disconnect and the generations that followed didn't get it. Watch this. Beginning with verse 7 in Judges chapter 2, the people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all of the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Look at verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook Him and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. Now the Bible makes it very clear, although Joshua was a great leader, somewhere along the line there was a disconnect with the next generation. And I want to say to you this morning that you can be as great a man of God as Joshua was. And if you and I are not absolutely intentionally minded, if we don't make up our mind and set our heart to pass something on to the next generation, we will drop the baton like Joshua's generation did. Are you listening to me? And I want to talk to you for a minute about attitudes. Because there's some attitudes in the body of Christ that absolutely have got to change. Listen, we're never going to pass anything on to the next generation if all we are doing is somehow in our head of believing that there's something de definitely wrong with the younger generation. Hello? Hello? Now listen to it get quiet in here this morning. Hello? Now preacher, you were preaching and now you're meddling. No, you need to hear this. Here's the truth. Sometimes as adults... We have no desire to pass anything on to the next generation. Because we don't like the next generation. We don't like the way they look. We don't like the way they talk. We don't like who they are. Because they're different than us. How many of you know that their hairstyles are a little different than yours? That would be because you don't have any hair. That would be one of the reasons right there. You're getting old. It's coming out. You can't quite do what they can do with their hair. 
Hello? We look at him and say, I can't believe. Look at that. Look at that, Ethel. Look at that. Look at that. It's a shame of work on it. Look at that. And they come to the house of the Lord dressed differently than we, we do. We come wearing what we're comfortable in. They come in. They have old jeans that are full of holes. I call them holy jeans. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Hello? 